the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation. The Chamber is pleased to host Minister George Heyman, Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy and Minister Responsible for Translink. Translink. I'm also pleased to uh, have Mayor Bob Wells in the room as well. And I believe at some point, MLA Ronna Ray Leonard will be joining us unless something else comes up. Things do change in, the, in, in government, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> the format of the meeting is as follows. First, we'll hear updates on the provincial budget from the minister and the chamber will pose questions. There will be an opportunity if time permits to ask questions from the chat room. And before we continue, I just wanted to thank um, the, uh, the provincial government for some of the chamber wins that, that we've seen. Uh, in terms of the provincial chamber in uh, some of the budget 2020 uh, things that were implemented uh, that we had lobbied for, which was the PST exemption on machinery and equipment, the transportation infrastructure, investment on Highway 1, investment in further developing the hydrogen economy, broadband and cellular connectivity in rural and remote communities, wholesale pricing for liquor for support to support hospitality licenses and increase training space for early childhood educators and funding for more spaces. We're uh, provincially, the Chambers of Commerce are very pleased to see those rolled out. And we've been very pleased to be part of the uh, Premier's Economic Recovery Task Force. That's it's been a great win for us as Chambers of Commerce across the province. So thank you. And now I will introduce our minister, uh, George Heyman was first elected as the MLA for Vancouver Fairview in 2013. Born and raised in Vancouver, George has lived and worked throughout Northwestern British Columbia since 2017. George has served as the Minister of Environment and Climate Change Strategy and previously served as the Opposition Spokesperson for Environment, Green Economy and Technology. In 2020, George also became the Minister Responsible for TransLink. Prior to his election as MLA, George was executive director of the Sierra Club BC, one of our province's oldest environmental advocacy and education organizations. He also served three terms as president of the BC Government and Services Employees Union, BCGEU, from 1999 to 2008. George has been a faculty member of Simon Fraser University's Dialogue and Negotiation Program, teaching courses in multi-party negotiations and collaborative decision-making. He has guest lectured at a number of universities in BC and abroad and served on advisory committees for postgraduate and undergraduate degree programs of three BC universities. He has also been a board member of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, BC, the Columbia Institute and the Workers' Compensation Board. George is a passionate advocate in Victoria for, it, for issues facing Fairview constituents, including education, healthcare, the arts, childcare, workers' rights, transit, and affordable housing. Since his appointment as the Minister of the Environment and Climate Change Strategy in July of 2017, George has been dedicated to advocating for the people and the environment against climate change. He took on a major role in creating the Clean, Clean BC plan aimed at the reduction of air pollution while creating more jobs and economic opportunities for people, businesses and communities in the renewable energy sector. And please join me in welcoming Minister Heyman. Thank you so much, Diane, and, uh, and thank you everyone for taking the time this morning to uh, to both uh, listen to the budget presentation and uh, ask me some questions and have a discussion. I want to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish and the tsleil peoples. Um, it's, uh, we were talking earlier, uh, it's uh, a pleasure to join uh, the Comox Valley Chamber of Commerce for the second year in a row. I think it was about 14 months ago we were uh, we were shifting to elbow bumping, and since then we've uh, we've had to uh, shift to significant social distancing. And uh, like all of you, I'm I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to the last stages of of the pandemic and uh, people having the opportunity to come together again, but more importantly to rebuild lives, rebuild businesses, rebuild communities and uh, and uh, once again uh, have the feeling of, uh, of strong connected uh, communities. Uh, 
Diane, you mentioned uh, MLA Ronna Ray Leonard, who does in fact have another meeting, but I uh, it was uh, it was one that was called uh, on an emergency basis. She'll be uh, I think joining us uh, partway through the discussion, um, and I just want to assure everyone that uh, that MLA Re Leonard has been a tireless advocate for a number of issues in your regions, uh, community issues, uh, business, small business issues. Uh, she is never shy about buttonholing me or other ministers to speak up for the community. Uh, first of all, I just want to express uh, gratitude to, uh, to Comox, to Courtney, to uh, small communities all around BC, to small businesses, to chambers of commerce who have done so much under such difficult circumstances to um, to adapt, to support people, to support uh, the people who work for you, to uh, try to hold the economy together, to be clear with uh, our government about what it is uh, you need. It has been a huge challenge. And uh, um, the resiliency that um, the chambers, that businesses, that individuals around British Columbia have shown has been uh, incredible. And we as government have tried to be uh, resilient and responsive as well. We're not through this yet, but we're, uh, we're I think, uh, on our way. And uh, as I talk about Budget 2021, I think you'll, uh, you'll see some of the things uh, we're putting in place. We have some reasons for hope. The, the vaccine rollout is ramping up. Uh, we're seeing a, a bit of a, a flattening in, uh, in the curve of, uh, of COVID infections in BC. In fact, the seven day rolling average has, uh, has finally dropped a bit. Um, that's no reason to let our guard down, but we, uh, we look at other places in the world. In fact, other places in Canada. And I know I feel fortunate that, um, that we found a, a way, if not to be perfect, to at least to be steady and, uh, and respond in, a, in an appropriate way to the challenges of the pandemic in front of us. And that's what, that's what Budget 2021 is about. It's about helping us build for the post-pandemic world to build back better. Uh, it's responding to the impacts of the pandemic, uh, preparing us for future challenges, not just rebuilding uh, businesses, but also investing in healthcare, strengthening the public services our communities depend on and businesses uh, depend on as well, uh, building a bridge to recovery and also ensuring that we're well positioned to deal with other ongoing challenges like the climate crisis. Uh, there's many, many important investments uh, in and around Comox and Vancouver Island, as well as uh, the rest of BC. Uh, the pandemic will end at some point. And when it does, I think uh, British Columbia is going to be ready uh, for the opportunities that will come with recovery. Marlene, if we could uh, move on to uh, slide one, please. We'll just wait a sec to get the screen up. So before I move on to budget de details, I just want to do a brief review of some of the broader economic picture. Uh, the slide you see in front of you shows uh, private sector growth forecasts for uh, Canada and the provinces. You'll see that uh, that BC's um, doing a, a little better than the Canadian average, and then and uh, a little better than many uh, many provinces. Uh, as you can see on the left, all provinces saw very significant. Uh, impacts uh, in the last year in terms of uh, a GDP, uh, negative GDP. Uh, British Columbia is a little better than in the middle. Uh, we're expecting recovery this year. Uh, in recent weeks, uh, private sector forecasters have updated near-term growth projections for BC uh, to show a stronger recovery. And they also show that BC's recovery is expected to be better than the national average. But I, I want to say that uh, Better than the national average is good, but uh, we know that for workers or businesses that uh, that aren't part of that recovery or growth, uh, that's uh, that's not the meaning people are looking for. That's not the recovery people are looking for. So our goal is to uh, is to minimize negative impact wherever we can and help um, every business, every community, every working person across uh, BC do better. But we can see that uh, BC's economy is resilient uh, and we have significant strength remaining. Uh, we have innovation, we have uh, diversity in our economy, we have a lot of highly skilled people, we have a lot of resources that we're doing our best to uh, manage sustainably, sustainably, and of course we're a trade gateway to Asia. Next slide please. 
Budget 2021 is, uh, of course, focused on the province's response and recovery from COVID. We want to make sure that government continues, uh, first and foremost, to protect the health and safety of British Columbians. Uh, we need to support people and businesses throughout the pandemic and to do the important work of preparing so that we can seize the opportunities that recovery will bring. In addition to new investments of $8.7 billion over the fiscal plan, we've included significant contingencies so that we can address issues that arise or, or uh, really good ideas that, uh, that need some help to get off the ground, as well as any, uh, any unforeseen uh, circumstances that require us to protect communities, businesses, and individuals. We want to ensure that we can continue to deliver a COVID-19 response and recovery and help to manage uh, ongoing uncertainties and risks. We have capital commitments in health, transportation, and education, investing in hospitals, schools, post-secondary facilities, transit, roads, and other infrastructure. And that's expected to be a record $26.4 billion over the fiscal plan, but that's an investment in strengthening uh, British Columbia's economy, uh, in strengthening British Columbia's communities and building for the future. Next slide, please. The pandemic has really highlighted the importance of a strong healthcare system and mental health services. Uh, if we don't have healthy people, we don't have a healthy economy, we don't have a healthy workforce, and in fact, we're creating a, a drain on, uh, on public resources. So you can see in terms of total base funding in uh, the Ministry of Health, uh, we've risen steadily from 2018 to 19. And you can see our uh, fiscal plan for uh, this fiscal year and the next two fiscal years uh, shows significant growth. Four billion for health and mental health to continue to protect people from COVID-19 and expand the services that our communities need. We're including continued support for the largest ever vaccination program in our history. We're not there yet, but we can see more and more people getting vaccinated. And uh, within a couple of months, we hope to re uh, reach the level uh, that uh, the medical professions tell us uh, equate to uh, herd, herd immunity and certainly uh, uh, lead to lower risk and uh, more security for people. We're also simultaneously uh, in budget 2021, including funding to reduce wait time for surgeries and give patients faster access to the help they need and additional support for seniors with improvement in long-term care and home care. On a mental health note, we know how difficult the pandemic has been for everyone, but it's especially true for people who already were struggling with mental health or addiction issues. Uh, the ongoing opioid crisis has deepened due to a changing toxic drug supply and the fact that, uh, that people were using in isolation. Our budget includes the largest investment in mental health services in BC history with a network of uh, mental health supports for youth through schools and new foundry centers, through integrated child and youth supports in 15 more school districts. We wanna increase access to a full spectrum of substance use treatment and recovery services including funding for op opioid treatment. We wanna help more people get on the path to recovery with new treatment and recovery beds and do much more. So we're investing in building critical health infrastructure with almost $8 billion in capital investments to support major projects like new and upgraded hospitals. Next slide, please. People and businesses across BC are working hard, just as they are in, uh, in Comox and Courtney, working hard to fight the virus and get life back on track. We wanna work to support you by continuing to invest in the services that people and businesses count on. We have budget increases, uh, funding for K to 12 education to support children, teachers, schools, and families free public transportation for children 12 and under in time for classes in September. And that should mean that families in the Comox Valley could save up to $400 per child per year. Next slide, please. We continue to make investments that benefit people and businesses in Comox and Vancouver Island. We recently announced a significant uh, investment in the next phase of our Clean Coast Clean Waters Initiative 
we've doubled the budget from last year to nine and a half million. 1,200 kilometers of BC's coastlines and more than 100 derelict vessels this year will be cleaned up from the North Coast to Southern Vancouver Island. It is the biggest shoreline cleanup in BC's history. We have partnerships with Coastal Indigenous Nations, the Small Ship Tour Operators Association, the Wilderness Tourism Association, the Coastal Restoration Society, <clears throat> and the Ocean Legacy Foundation. This, these are important supports, not just for cleaning up uh, pollution and waste, but to support the tourism sector that has been hard hit by the downturn. The previous work in the first phase created 180 jobs and removed 127 tons of debris. Next slide, please. As part of our economic recovery, we're also investing $27 million to restore watersheds and wetlands across BC, including in the Comox area. We have 70 projects, so we'll 750 jobs. Uh, healthy watersheds mean healthy communities. It's more important than ever as we prepare for the impacts of climate change. The Comox Valley Watershed Society in partnership with the Comox First Nation and the city of Courtney will be dismantling a former sawmill site on the Courtney River known as Couscous Sum. And I just wanna, uh, I wanna note that uh, this was one issue that MLA Leonard was tireless in, uh, in lobbying before. And therefore when we saw an opportunity, uh, the ground was already set to seize it. We're gonna restore it to uh, its native estuary, salt marsh and forest state. A second project with the Comox Valley Watershed Society in partnership with the Comox Nation and Ducks Unlimited will restore water quality and spawning channels in the Glen Urquhart Creek watershed. Together, two projects will employ more than 50 people through a $750,000 investment. Another economic recovery investment is the Youth Employment Program supporting employment with BC Parks and the BC Conservation Officer Service. These will include more than 80 jobs in total, including BC Parks positions out of Black Creek. And I am hopeful, and I've, I've actually seen this from the first phase, uh, that some of these uh, young people give it, getting their first opportunity to work as COs or park assistants, uh, uh, working under park rangers, are seeing the opportunity for a career and filling the vacancies that are being created as people retire or as we invest more in our park system. As you can see from this slide on Clean BC, we know that climate change is an ongoing and the most pressing issue facing not just our province, but the world. We need to make sure that our post COVID future is sustainable. We need a clean economy with good jobs and we need to ensure that businesses are able to transition to and be competitive in a net zero emissions future. Uh, you've heard about Clean BC. It's our plan to build a, a cleaner, more sustainable future, an economic plan, as well as a, a climate action plan. Budget 2021 includes an additional $506 million in new investments for Clean BC. And that brings the total five-year funding to nearly $2.2 billion. We're investing $130 million in clean transportation, zero emission vehicles, electric charging stations being uh, put in place uh, on Vancouver Island and the rest of the province as they are throughout Canada uh, with investments, significant investments from the BC government. We see tech development and electrification of school buses, uh, ferries and government fleets. Uh, we wanna build on investments in the Comox Valley and Vancouver Island, for instance, the Clean BC Communities Fund is installing 28 EV stations on Vancouver Island in partnership with local and regional governments. That includes 10 stations through the Comox Valley Regional District and the cities of Courtney, Comox and Cumberland. This budget includes a number of other supports for better, more energy efficient homes and buildings. There's going to be a new center for innovation and clean energy uh, with investment from the BC government and from uh, partner industries. That's continuing our commitment to look for cleaner energy sources uh, to help clean up industry with over 519 million over three years in our Clean BC program for industry. It's important that we also find ways to work not just with our large industries, but with small businesses who also pay carbon tax so that we can help by reinvesting and supporting uh, um, 
application of technologies and uh, energy efficiency that will help people be cleaner, reduce the carbon emissions, and save uh, long money long term. We're working on some new programs that I hope to unveil uh, in the late summer, early fall to assist with that. We're also removing the, uh, the provincial sales tax from the purchase of e-bikes. And uh, we're seeing, uh, I don't know if we're seeing it yet in your region, but we're seeing in a number of uh, areas that there's a big shift to last mile delivery to, uh, to e-bikes. It's saving uh, businesses, particularly uh, uh, restaurants, uh, money and delivery it's uh it's got a, a role to play in uh, delivering uh, uh small parcels and um and it is helping our environment for sure next slide please i think we all uh, we all accept now and we've heard from uh, businesses large and small across canada that investments in childcare <clears throat> are an investment in our workforce our investment in our labor needs and an investment in our con our economy and we're going to continue to make progress. We funded 26,000 new childcare spaces with thousands more that will be funded each year through this budget. We're also supporting wage increases for early childhood educators because we need skilled, trained, certified, responsible workers who can actually afford to work in the field they've chosen and continue that and continue in those jobs to give uh, to give the system stability. Our budget more than doubles the number of children who can get care for $10 a day or less through our prototype program. And we're including 400 new spaces for the Aboriginal Head Start program, which will provide culturally relevant childcare for Indigenous families. The COVID-19, next slide please. The COVID-19 pandemic has also contributed to the high activity in the housing market. We expect some moderation in 2022 as the recovery takes hold, and we've worked hard to address speculation, reduce rent increases, and we have a rent freeze in, in effect, and then rent increases uh, following that limited to the cost of living. But we need to continue our work to build over 114,000 affordable homes over 10 years. More than 26,000 new homes have been completed or underway. This year's budget funds new low and middle income housing through nonprofit providers and 1.6 billion of provincial capital investment. We have $2 billion in financing to expand the housing hub program run through, um, through BC Housing. And this will help to create 9,000 new homes over the next three to five years on top of 1,000 units already completed. We know that housing is not just a challenge in Metro Vancouver. It's a challenge uh, throughout the province, uh, and it is ultimately our commitment uh, to supply affordable housing and build it for low and moderate income people that is going to moderate uh, the housing market uh, and ensure that uh, our kids and grandkids will be able to afford homes and rents into the future. And the budget also builds 55 units of low income rent in Campbell River to be operated by the Campbell River and North Island Transition Society. Uh, the city and the province through BC Housing will be working together. This mixed use building will include larger units for women and children, accessible units for senior women and ground floor commercial space. This will be in addition to the approximately 263 units of housing completed or in development throughout the region since 2017. And we're continuing funding for the partial seismic replacement of the Lake Trail Middle School in the Comox Valley. Next, please. We have, uh, we're going to keep uh, building to help businesses prepare for the opportunities that recovery will bring. We need to build on the supports that we've provided to small, medium and large businesses over the past year. And in practical terms, this means that the stronger BC tax incentive for employers that have hired or increased compensation in the last quarter of 2020 um, is you can see that compared to the previous quarter. We need more funding and we'll have more funding for the Grow BC, Feed BC and Buy BC programs that will help our agriculture sector. We have a PST exemption going into place for select machinery and equipment uh, to assist businesses 
and we have ongoing funding for small and medium-sized business recovery grant program, including supports for the hardest hit sectors like tourism, arts, and hospitality, like $120 million to support the tourism recovery starting in 2021-22, including support for major track attractions that help make BC a unique destination for tourism and have spin-off effects uh, for communities throughout the province. We have additional funding for community destination development grants that will help communities prepare for future visitors through new tourism infrastructure like trails and airport improvements. We're supporting 14,000 restaurants, bars, breweries, wineries, gym and fitness centers through the most recent health restrictions uh, with our circuit breaker business recovery grants. And we're adjusting our response as the landscape changes. We hope it's changing for the better, but when people are impacted, when businesses are impacted by restrictions, we know that British Columbians expect us to keep our communities together and keep our businesses able to hold on until things get better. The relief grant, the circuit breaker business relief grant is a great example of this. It was a program developed in less than a week. Uh, we've just added an additional $75 million to the circuit breaker relief program, expanded eligibility criteria, recognizing the challenges that are facing the hospitality, fitness and accommodation sectors. Next slide, please. We also have made reconciliation with Indigenous people a cross-government priority. We know it's a cross-province priority. We can see that in, uh, in the actions taking place in, by local governments, by small businesses, and by large businesses alike. So Budget 2021 includes stable funding to support engagement on issues like land and resource activities, as well as legislation and policy. We're providing more funding to create more childcare spaces for Indigenous families. We're delivering the skills training initiatives that will lead to long-term employment. And we're investing in cultural safety and humility training courses across health and mental health addiction services. Our government will continue to work with Indigenous people and First Nations communities to ensure that we create a stronger and inclusive BC for everyone. I think we all know we're better off when everyone in British Columbia, particularly our first peoples, are able to participate on an equal level, equal basis with everyone in the province. We will all lift each other up if we do that. Next slide, please. <clears throat> in closing, uh, as I started, we've all been through a lot. We all hope we don't have a whole lot more of this to go through. It's been unprecedented. And I know the challenge has been particularly acute in the Comox Valley. Our recovery won't happen overnight, but if we focus on the things that matter most to people and businesses, we will make progress together. We're gonna to continue to provide those supports. Budget 2021 will help us stay safe and healthy now and into the future, a future that we see holding great opportunities for everyone to be part of a strong economic recovery. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me today and I'd be happy to take questions and have a discussion. Thank you, Minister Heyman. I also want to mention that uh, Her Worship, uh, Leslie Baer is on the line now. She's the mayor of Cumberland. Leslie, thanks so much for joining us. And as well, MLA Ronna Ray Leonard is on the line. And if anyone wants to put their questions in the chat room, I can facilitate them that way. I had a question, Diane. Yes. I can't type that fast, so I'll just speak. <laughs> okay, sounds good. You know, I don't do enough research, uh, Minister, and thank you for the presentation, first of all. Um, and I was really happy to hear uh, all the hard work that's being done about cleaning our coasts of derelict vessels uh, up and down the, uh, our island anyway. Um, you know, I haven't, um, maybe you can help me, I just haven't seen a lot of legislation or maybe there has. I just, it seems like there's, there's money being given, but are we doing the right thing to prevent it happening in the first place? 
Uh, the, oh, you mean on derelict vessels? Yes, sir. Uh, that is uh, ultimately a federal government responsibility. I mean, there's a very limited uh, connection with the Ministry of uh, Forest Lands and Natural Resource Operations. If uh, uh, if there is um, uh, a mooring uh, attached to uh, to Crown land, but that's about it. So we are uh, actively engaging with the federal government to try to address this problem. But when we saw an opportunity um, to to help clean up uh, the coast and the environment that uh, we depend on for for food, for tourism, for uh, uh, for so many things, for our sense of uh, British Columbia, and put people back to work. Uh, we decided to seize the opportunity and uh, and not leave it to somebody else. That's not to say we want the federal government off the hook, but I agree with you. Uh, we need uh, we need a system that uh, that stops the problem from. We don't need uh, the derelict vessels. We're cleaning up to be replaced by new ones. Thank you. Thanks, David. If people are more comfortable, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask a question. There aren't, we don't have a lot of people on the call, so I don't think we'll have challenges with people interrupting one another. I myself am very thrilled about the Kuskusum project. I was uh, born and raised in the Comox Valley. I grew up playing along the uh, the waterfront um, in the along on the Courtney side of the estuary, and it's it's exciting. I'm, I can hardly wait to see how it's going to unfold. So I'm 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 really thrilled about this project. Well, and I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, to coming back and seeing what it looks like. Uh, um, you have such a beautiful area, and uh, I wasn't able to stay there uh, very long when I was up 14 months ago. I'm uh, I'm hoping to. I keep saying I. I hope to come and spend some time in communities and uh, um, usually I'm in and out, but uh, it's very tempting to stick around and uh, leave some of my money in your area. <laughs> well, we'd certainly take it. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a question in the chat line. And yes, when uh, when you're able to, we, we extend an invitation to you, of course. <laughs> and David yes. has a lovely hotel that he manages uh, that uh, has a spa in it as well, so. Great, has he put in a, a level two charger yet? <laughs> no, we, yeah, no, we, I, we do. We have a one of those dual. Excellent. Dual, yeah. Excellent. There you go, you're there's, set. <laughs> there's, good, uh, there's good provincial government grants to help with that. Uh, a question from uh, Ram Ramon um, Ramirez. When it comes to environment, what would you consider to be quick win initiatives that could be implemented at the local government level? We are seeing more and more plastic residues in our planet. And as much as we want to support recycling, we see more plastic packaging in our stores many times, and it's very inefficient. Are there any initi initiatives to regulate packaging? Uh, we are in the process of uh, developing our Clean BC Plastics Action Plan, which has a number of uh, a number of levels. I've, I've learned as minister that, um, and, and you know in local government, you, you know what you want to do. It's not as easy as saying we're going to do it tomorrow. People need a chance to transition and phase or it won't be successful. But uh, we have approved uh, uh, plastic bag bans and single-use plastic bans in a number of communities in the province because uh, as the law currently stands, they have to be approved by, uh, by the Minister of Environment. But we are also working on enabling legislation that... Uh, uh, that will transfer that uh, responsibility to local governments as long as uh, uh, certain criteria are met around health and safety and uh, accessibility. Some people, uh, some people with um, with disabilities uh, need uh, need to use, uh, for instance, plastic straws. Although we're also hoping that uh, there'll be more widely available alternatives. Uh, I think um, one of the things that really makes a difference, uh, and we've seen this with the Ocean Legacy Foundation and uh, and surf riders on the west coast of the island, is uh, raising um, awareness about plastic waste. I've I learned more than I ever wanted to know about plastic waste, but it's very useful in my job. When I joined a couple of uh, of um, cleanups around the False Creek area, uh, very close to my constituency, as well as on the streets and. Uh, my constituency of Vancouver Fairview and also on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So organizing uh, plastic cleanups, I think, really helps uh, expand public awareness, leading to reduction of waste. We're also uh, working on, um, 
on uh, legislation uh, and regulation to ultimately ban a range of single-use plastics in uh, in British Columbia. We have a, a, a timetable we're working on for that. We had one discussion paper and we'll be laying out our intentions uh, very shortly. I think local government can certainly piggyback on that and uh, and get your own people in your own community ready to do it, maybe even with a challenge to get there uh, a bit more quickly involving uh, local businesses as well as uh, uh, local people. And we're, we're working very hard to expand the uh, the recycling opportunities for a, a range of plastic containers and others, as well as uh, I don't think this is as much of an issue in Courtney Comox, but it, it may be for some uh, uh, for some of uh, the neighboring areas. Uh, we're working hard to ensure that uh, we can put measures in place that make recycling easier in more sparsely populated uh, communities where economies of scale really are an issue. And one of the ways we're doing that is by trying to invest in a recycled plastics manufacturing uh, program for uh, British Columbia. We have one uh, very successful company in BC already, and uh, we, we have others we know or are wanting to seize that opportunity. Uh, people don't want to look at CBC News and uh, and see that uh, plastic they recycled is ending up in some other country's uh, uh, landfills, uh, and we don't want to see that either. Yes, we the chamber team did a shoreline cleanup down at Buckley Bay, and we were uh, we were very surprised at the amount of waste that we picked up in the short time period that we were there. So I think it is a great way to be enlightened about what's happening on our shorelines. I have a question from uh, Jason Hui. Uh, the budget 2020 definitely responds and addresses the pandemic issue more, and it should. But my question is, does that slow down the government to address the environmental issue comparing to the pre-pandemic period? I don't think it has. If anything, I think uh, uh, it may have helped us um, speed it up and raise our ambition. I think uh, whether it's uh, in the United States uh, recently or certainly in states of, uh, within the United States like Washington State, uh, Oregon, California, even before the, <clears throat> the election, uh, people were really seeing it as an opportunity to speed up the transition to uh, uh, a more climate conscious economy and uh, and reducing uh, reliance on fossil fuels as well as uh, reducing the emissions from the production of those fuels that we're we're continuing to use for a period of time we uh, in talking to uh, uh, to industry uh, I know they have ambition they just want to ensure that they have the support and assistance of government so they remain competitive against uh, other producers and suppliers that aren't uh, that aren't facing the, uh, the same uh, ambition uh, and carbon uh, pricing that we have in BC. Fortunately, we're seeing other jurisdictions catch up. So uh, we are working hard to complete our roadmap to 2030 by this fall for our 2030 emission targets. We have a very active uh, Climate Solutions Council that is providing uh, advice and accountability uh, for us on a, on a regular basis. Uh, and um, one of the things that I'm really hoping to do uh, in the coming months is to uh, find ways for the provincial government to um, extend the kind of program that we've offered to uh, large um, emissions intensive industries to uh, smaller and medium businesses to help decarbonize because we need to do that at every level. We also have uh, a significant uh, um, plans to uh, help uh, decarbonize the and I find cleaner fuels or zero emission transportation in the um, in the trucking and uh, transportation industry. There are some challenge programs as well, especially use vehicle incentive programs that will uh, help do that at every level. So uh, I've seen no indication from the premier that um, that he's asking me to slow down. In fact, uh, he's asking me to uh, meet the challenge. He's doing more than asking me to meet the challenge, actually. He's demanding that I meet it. <laughs> Thank you for um, a very thorough and well thought out budget. That comes from Pam, our, one of our board members. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I know we have, I believe we have three uh, media people on the line. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. 
the floor is open for you. I think I have, uh, I think I have uh, in about three or four minutes, I have a, another Zoom uh, um, place where there's gonna be a bit of a media conference, so they can, okay. but it's gonna be also be an opportunity, maybe with others who are waiting to join into that. Okay, good, that's good, yeah. Does anyone else have any questions for the minister? If not, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you all and your community in person, um, <clears throat> hopefully in not too many months. Thank you so much for taking the time to arrange this, you and your staff, and for speaking to the Chamber of Commerce. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you, everyone, for coming.